Welcome back to the 18th group exhibit Hydrogen Fuel Cells at Hanover Fair 2012. My name is Quella Hermans and I invite everybody who doesn't have a seat yet, please join us, uh, relax, uh, get a coffee on the house and join us in our next topic. Next up we're going to explore the development of a hydrogen infrastructure in the UK. And it is my great pleasure to introduce to you the CEO of ITM Power PLC, freshly joined uh, from Sheffield in the UK, Dr. Graham Cooley. So please, give a warm welcome to Dr. Cooley. Welcome there. The microphone? Thank you. Okay. So, um, tell us something about what you do. What should we know about ITM Power PLC? Nope. That's okay. Hello. Can you, oh, good. You can hear oh, great. me. Okay. At ITM, we're interested in um, energy storage and clean fuel. So, we're interested in coupling electrolyzers with renewable power and making hydrogen and deploying it as a transport fuel. Okay. And uh, in doing so, what would you say is your unique uh, element that you bring to the table, the unique proposition that ITM Power PLSE has in the market that you operate in? Okay, so what's unique about ITM Power? I think, first of all, we're interested in whole systems. So we make hydrogen energy systems. Um, we're able to couple to renewable power because we have electrolyzers that you can turn on and off very quickly. So they can assimilate intermittent power inputs. Um, so we make containerized electrolysis that can be switched on and off in one second. Um, so that can cope with the levels of intermittency that you get from renewable power. Now most electrolyzers, when you turn them on, you have to run them up over a number of hours some even half a day, and you can't really turn them off. Um, and and we, we took exactly the opposite approach. We said, look, the application requires you to be able to cope with very high levels of intermittency. So that's how we design our, our products. Just one other thing, mm. um, we all are also able to uh, generate hydrogen at high pressure. So um, at the moment, the H fuel unit that you'll see outside works at 15 bar, but our latest unit, which can w uh, we package I in sizes of a megawatt and up, uh, that can generate hydrogen at 80 bar. And that means you can either um, uh, inject it directly into the gas grid, or you can use it as a transport fuel with uh, and, and eliminate one of the compression steps, which saves you money and energy. Right. So, just to summarize, a uh, very rapid turn on and off and high pressure uh, um, electrolysis. And what is the exact benefit of the rapid uh, turn on and off? Yeah, I mean, uh, today we have a power network which is a whole new power network. We're trying to assimilate renewable power, um, and when the wind blows, or when the sun shines, you have the cloud effect, or you have uh, um, very rapid changes in power coming from renewable power units. So you have to balance um, that on the um, on the demand side, and the way you do you can do that. And our vision is to have uh, um, electrolysis units that you turn on and off very quickly, balancing supply and demand. And that is quite unusual today in the market. That yeah, I, I don't know of any other electrolysis equipment that could do that. Okay, so on a more general level then, why store renewable power? What's the, what's the, what's the reason and the pressing reason behind it? Yeah, okay. So um, in the old days, the way that you balance supply and demand in a power network was you did it all on the supply side. So you turn on and off power stations as customers turn on and off their equipment and you balance the supply and demand. And you have to do that dynamically in a power network, and you have to do it um, at sub-second or even sub-cycle timescales. Okay, today, in the UK, 9% of our capacity, or 3% of our energy, it's the sun and the wind that decide when the power is generated. So you have to shift some of the control from the supply side to the demand side. 
So you need pieces of equipment that you can turn on and off on the supply side. Sorry, on the demand side. And that's what you can do with these electrolyzers. You deploy them and the power companies can demand side manage them and turn them on and off when they need to couple against renewable power. Right. That almost brings us back to our more, more, more general aggregate topic of a UK infrastructure. But before I make that shift, are there any questions from our audience on what you've heard and what's been said? Otherwise, I'll get back to you. Okay, um, returning then to our topic, the hydrogen infrastructure for the UK. Um, what are some of the most noteworthy projects currently being pursued and coming out of the UK? Uh, why are they, uh, why, why do they show good practice, best practice? What can we maybe learn from them? Okay, um, I guess the most significant project in the UK in hydrogen is UKH2 Mobility. Mm -hmm. So UKH2 Mobility was established a few months ago now um, and it's a, a government-backed project um, and it's all the car, car uh, companies, so OEMs, and also gas companies getting together to plan an infrastructure in the UK. Um, it's called UKH2 Mobility in analogy to the German project and, and as far as the UK government is concerned, um, the UK will be um, a, a rapid follower of the initiative in Germany. Right. So it, it's, it's very significant for the UK. We have um, um, DEC and BIRS and the Department of Transport. That's three government departments have all signed an MOU um, with um, major uh, um, automotive OEMs and gas companies to, to conduct this project. Um, and it's also sponsored by a UK government minister, Mark Prisk. Okay. So uh, actually, it goes all the way to the top of government. Okay, great. Um, could you tell us, because that, that sort of brings us actually to the, to the energy mix uh, that, that characterizes the UK. Could yeah. you tell us a little bit more about this energy mix and how it compares to other territories perhaps where, where of interest? Sure. Um, so in the UK, we have um, the richest wind resource in Europe. Um, actually, a lot of it's centered in Scotland, Scotland yeah. and in Northern Ireland yeah. and the west coast of Ireland, but it's very, very rich. Um, and actually, if you plant up with the, the, and exploit that very rich uh, wind resource, then you'll have a lot of renewable power. So we could have as much as 30% renewables in the UK. And in fact, Scotland's plan is to have between 80 and 100% renewable energy in Scotland. Now that's a really big challenge and that requires either some very big interconnectors with the rest of the UK or a lot of energy storage and, and probably realistically both of those solutions. What's the projected timeline on a, on a target such as the one you just described yeah, in Scotland? Most of our timelines are to 2020. Okay. Um, so look, we're an island system effectively. Um, we have some interconnections, but we're nowhere near as interconnected as some other European countries. So assimilating a lot of renewable power is quite difficult in the UK and will require a lot of energy storage. And I think hydrogen is a fantastic solution. What you can do then is use the renewable power and have some joined up thinking between the power industry and the transport industry. Uh, making um, hydrogen with your renewable power. So it's also about actually bringing the right stakeholders together and, and, and managing their Absolutely. We, we have a, another important project in the UK which we're involved in called Eco Island. Um, and Eco Island is the Isle of Wight. And what the Isle of Wight is being used for in the UK is to be the a demonstration of how you bring together renewable power, a smart grid, and hydrogen energy storage. And actually, we're the hydrogen partner. We also work with on the island with Scottish and Southern Energy, um, IBM, Cable and Wireless, and Toshiba. And, and that project is to demonstrate for the first time um, using renewable power for the whole energy system. 
And of course, it's easier to do it on an island because an island has a, a, has a small system. Best to build a small one first before right. you roll it's out a, a large one. It's a test case that hopefully, potentially, might then be uh, uh, learned, le lessons might be learned from it or it might be scaled up. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Make a small one first. As a, as a, and w sure. what you need is a critical mass of all of the technologies required all in one place. And that for the UK is Eco Island. So we've heard two projects. Are there any others that need to be mentioned in this context? Or Yeah, I mean, w the, the other major project that we were involved in was the HOST um, trials. HOST stands for Hydrogen On-Site Trials. Now, I'm not going to say too much about this because my colleague Steve Hallett is going to describe it in great detail at one of these forums. But the, the HOST trials were all about engagement with commercial companies who might want to trial hydrogen. And so for, for ITM, we, we conducted that trial over a whole year and it was funded by the UK uh, Technology Strategy Board. So money derived from um, the UK government. And in fact, you can see the unit that we used outside in the ride and drive. Oh, great. So please make a point of actually having a look at that. Uh, are there any questions at this point? Yes, we have a question. Just wait for me, sir. I have actually a question to your uh, electrolysis technology. You mentioned one megawatt, 80 mm -hmm. bars. Is this polymer, elect uh, polymer electrolysis or alkaline electrolysis? Yeah, um, the, it, um, the technology that we use actually is confidential. If you're a genuine customer and you want to sign a confidentiality agreement, under those circumstances, I'd be happy to discuss it with you. OK, any other questions? We were discussing earlier today about feed-in tariffs for um, hydrogen. What are the plans in the UK to subsidize the start of the technology? Yeah, very Feed-in tariffs. So it's a very good question. So I, I asked that exact question to um, our uh, scientific, uh, government scientific advisor, David Mackay. Uh, there isn't an answer to the question uh, right now. Um, in the UK, if you plant up with renewable power, you get a capacity payment and a feed-in payment. Um, and um, the feed-in payment is about three and a half pence. The capacity payment depends on the technology that you're using and can be anything from 40 pence to 10 pence. So there's a, there's a big range. But what that means then is that you get the capacity payment um, whether you feed into the grid or not. You can then uh, use the power to make hydrogen rather than feeding into the grid. Um, is, is there a defined um, tariff for hydrogen? No, there isn't. Is there a defined tariff for energy storage? No, there isn't. Fine. So um, returning once more to the... Um uh, 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 topic of, of an infrastructure, hydrogen infrastructure in the UK. We know that fuel cells and hydrogen are increasingly considered as the way forward in energy security and efficiency. Um, but the question that I want to put to you is on this, on this bigger picture, is it really happening? What are some of the remaining barriers? Or put differently, why hydrogen and why now? Okay, why hydrogen and why now? Um, let me take the why now, first of all. Um, I, I think the um, whole world is looking at the future of oil and fossil fuels. And I think fossil fuels and oil are getting more and more problematic. It's the first thing. Second thing is that the whole world is planting up with intermittent renewable power. Um, and renewable power does need energy storage. And actually, you can solve both of those problems with hydrogen. Uh, when you would turn down the wind power, you can make your own fuel on site and it gives you fuel security. And of course, if you make it with renewable power, it's got a zero carbon footprint. So that's the first thing. You're, you're, you're looking at the problem of intermittent renewables and oil and combining those two things together and to give you fuel security. Um, why now? Um, well, uh, I think um, all over the world, people have tested electric vehicles. Um, they take too long to charge and they don't go far enough. Two so uh, uh, those two problems are solved by hydrogen vehicles. And, and the reason that it's happening so rapidly now is because the automotive manufacturers are now involved. 
If the car companies weren't involved, it wouldn't happen, uh, but they are. You have almost scarily anticipated uh, my last question to you, um, Dr. Cooley. Um, I'll just say it like this. I want to uh, finish by asking you, who would you rather not talk to this week at Hanover Fair? Or put differently, what is your key piece of advice to anyone wanting to be part of the hydrogen economy? And what shouldn't we do? Okay, um, what shouldn't we do, um, I think, is, um, is over-promote and have people believe that all of the problems will be solved immediately. When you introduce new technology, it's often um, more expensive than you would like in the long run, requires economies of scale, and requires a lot of customers so that you can get the cost structure that you need. So what you do have to have is some government subsidies at the beginning. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if you look at the effect on solar, for instance, of having government subsidies, creating volume, and then seeing how the prices come down, it's a very good analogy with hydrogen. So what shouldn't we do? Uh, pretend that everything's solved already and that there aren't going to be some technological uh, barriers to solve. Uh, but the, the prize is huge. The prize is decarbonizing the whole energy system and about fuel security and energy security um, across Europe and the rest of the world, which is a massive prize if you get it right. That's all we have time for today, but um, ITM Power PLC will be represented uh, here again on this stage th later this week. For now, if you have further questions or would like to speak to Dr. Uh, Cooley again, uh, please just make your way to stand B. 60. Um, I'd like to thank you for your very insightful uh, perspective today on the uh, UK hydrogen uh, uh, infrastructure. And uh, we will continue now at 2 p.m. Uh, with a, uh, I believe, a German uh, or panel in the, in the German language. Uh, die Brennstoffzelle fürs Eigenheim Strom uh, versus Wärme selbst gemacht with Alexander Dauensteiner at Weiland GB, GmbH. Thank you ever so much. Thank you. And by the way, our technology is working outside, refueling a bus. If you'd like to go and have a look, there's scheduled refuels, uh, so you can watch how all that works. The next one is at four o'clock. Thanks. Four o'clock it is. Thank you very much. Thank you.